Hey guys, welcome to Piping Engineers. In today's video, we will learn about the basic cooling tower terminologies. We will see what are the terms that we use while studying about the cooling towers and while dealing with the cooling towers. So guys, for more videos and updates, please like, follow and subscribe to our channel. So let's begin our today's video and learn what are the terms that we use in the cooling towers. So guys, let's start our video. So basically before starting it, I want to ask you a simple question. What is a cooling tower? So guys, cooling towers are basically heat exchangers in which water and air come in contact with each other to lower the temperature of hot water. Basically, what happens is it is a part of a process industry or in HVAC industry, the hot water has to be cooled because it it is again circulated in the system so that hot water has to lose its temperature somewhere so basically what a cooling tower does is in cooling tower your hot water centers from a place and it is and the air is entered to the from from another side so basically what happens is the hot water loses its temperature with this cooled air from the atmosphere so the main task main task of the cooling tower is to reject heat into the atmosphere from hot water there are many auxiliaries and it is basically a thermal engineering concept that is that are used in while preparing a cooling tower and while calculating the heat load. So cooling towers are basically a relatively inexpensive and dependable means of removing low grade heat. So most of the industries, most of the process industries and most of the things they are they use cooling towers because they are with their capex may be higher but from opex point of view cooling towers are very cheap. And the th one, one thing is that we have to continuously add makeup water to the cooling tower cold basin. Uh, that makeup why makeup water is added to the cooling tower. We will be learning in this video itself. We have added a slide. So uh, we will be telling you why makeup water is added in the cooling tower. So this makeup water is also added in the cooling tower uh, and in addition to the water that is being circulating in the cooling tower. So basically from where does this hot water comes in your cooling tower? The hot water is generally discharged into the cooling tower from condensers of centrifugal chillers, VAM chillers, heat exchanger and industrial processes. So as there is a water scarcity throughout the universe, throughout the world. So what we do, we, do, we can't waste the water. So basically what happens is hot water from the process is coming into the cooling tower. It is basically getting cooled and the again cold water is being circulated into, into the system. So this is a complete closed cycle and this closed cycle in this closed cycle the temperature of hot water is lost with, with the through the uh, through the cold air with the help of a cooling tower. So this is a one liner in which we can define a cooling tower. So basically they takes the heat of uh, hot water with the help of air and many other auxiliaries associated with it. So I hope there would be a single line clarity of cooling tower guys. So let's begin our today's main concept video and learn about the terms that we use while we talk about the cooling towers. So guys the first thing that come across while discussing a cooling tower is your frame and casing. So you would have seen your cooling towers, the, you would have seen some super structures in your cooling towers. So may, that, that may be of RCC and nowadays some metal based uh, that is your CCCT that is your closed circuit cooling towers are also coming. So the frame and casing are two important things. Uh, in your casings, it is the external structure frames that support the exterior enclosures like your motors, fans and other components. With smaller designs such as glass fiber units, the casing may be essentially may be the frame. So basically this is the difference between a frame and casing. So the next and the most important material is your fill. So basically what this fill is, you would have seen uh, the fill basically what does this fill does? If I talk in a layman language, this fill when water is being sprayed into this cooling tower. So there are fills uh, here like this, these fills are here. So what this happens when water is getting dropped on these fills, this the uh, water is again split into smaller parts. So when the surface area of these droplets increases, so the, uh, what happens is the more air contact in the air contact increases and the temperature of the hot liquid is easily lost. So fills most cooling tower employ fills. Uh, basically they are of plastic or wood depending upon the design designer to designer they vary but in most of the cases now people are going for either plastic fills or metallic fills also. So they are basically they basically facilitate heat transfer by maximizing water and air contact. 
So as I told you, how do we uh, maximize the water and air contact when a water droplet is uh, dropped in this uh, fill? So it again splits into. You would have seen that phenomena. So it again splits into. Uh, I would say five to ten droplets. So the air, uh, more air will get. Uh, more air will get in touch with those droplets and the temperature losing will be easy. So basically there are two types of fills that are we use. One is your splash type, another is your fill, film fill. So this is your splash fill. So you would have seen this is your splash fill in your first image and this is your film fill. So basically film fill may be your corrugated or honeycomb. So what happens in this fills? The water is uh, water, uh, water gently flows from topwards to downwards position. And these are uh, sp uh, these these are uh, stacked one above the other. While your splash fill, they are not stacked; they are independently separated from each other. So basically, this is the purpose of a fill. Next is your cold water basin. Cold water is basin is basically a storage tank that is below the cooling tower uh, in which your cold water is stored. So this is your cold water basin. You would have seen the hot water is entering from here inside. This is a fill uh, in between it, and this is your cold water basin. So the cold water basin is uh, basically it depends upon your uh, water capacity, the amount of water that you, that will be handled by your cooling tower. So depending upon that, we design your cold water basin. So let's move on to our next uh, terminologies and see it. So our next thing is your drip eliminator. So guys, drip eliminator is one of the important thing. Uh, in our next slides, we will be learning about a loss called drift loss. So basically that drift loss is eliminated by drift eliminators. So basically so what happens is some of the sum of uh, water uh, goes away with the air because the there is high speed air and water is coming from up, upside down and because of uh, our fills the size of water droplets also goes down. So what happens is uh, uh, some of the water droplets entrapped in the air stream that otherwise will be lost to the atmosphere. So to stop those stop those water going outside from cooling towers, we use drift eliminators. So drift eliminator is one of the important auxiliaries of cooling tower so that our maker water consumption of cooling tower can also be reduced. Next is your air inlet. Air inlet basically it depends upon cooling tower to cooling tower. So if your cooling tower is uh, you guys say cross flow. So cross flow cooling tower air enters from these levers. And if you are suppose if you if you are having our um, counter, if you are having our uh, counter flow force draft, so air will be entering from this side. So air inlet is also basically one of the thing that uh, according to which the cooling tower type depends. So the point of entry of air entering a tower. So the inlet may take up an entire side of cross flow cooling tower or located low on the side of bottom counter flow designs. As I told you, it may enter from these sides also and it may enter from the below also. So this is your air inlet part. Next is your levers. Levers, this part, this this blackish part that is coming outside, they are levers. So basically, what levers do? The purpose of levers is to equalize air flow into the cooling tower. So we want a uh, basically we want our temperature of water to get cooled down evenly. So it should be evenly distributed or equalized temperature drop should be there. So to maintain for that purpose, we need uh, that air should also be equalized to maintain that equalization of air guys levers are used and these are very basic uh, design thing. If we if, if the design of levers is not proper, so there may be chances your cooling tower doesn't performs as per the requirements. Next year, next is your nozzles. If you can see here, this is your nozzles part. So the water that comes on the top of the cooling tower, it is sprayed through the nozzles. It basically comes like this and it is sprayed on the fills with the help of nozzles. So again, we want a uniform distribution so that uniform temperature drop is there. So uniform temp uniform cooling is attained. So that is attained with the help of nozzle. Uniform water distribution at the top of the fill into cheap proper wetting. So that is achieved with the help of nozzles. So let's see our next part. So next part is range and approach. Basically these three terms range, approach, cooling tower effectiveness. These are associated with your cooling tower efficiency. And based upon your range and approach, uh, we define how to design a cooling tower. So basically when, when we go for designing a cooling tower, we ask for these things only. Range, what is the range? What is the approach? And uh, when we ask for approach, there is a term called wet bulb temperature. That is a very important psychometric term. So this is this is a thing. So basically what is the range? So range is guys. It is the difference between your inlet temperature and outlet temperature. 
तो सपोज इफ आर कूलिंग टावर हैज अ वाटर एंट्री टेम्परेचर ऑफ फोर्टी फाइव डिग्री सेल्सियस एंड एंड इन आउटलेट टेम्परेचर इज थर्टी फोर डिग्री सेल्सियस सो फोर्टी फाइव माइनस थर्टी फोर तो दिस इज योर हॉट वाटर इट इज एट फोर्टी फाइव एंड आउटलेट इज एट थर्टी फोर सो फोर्टी फाइव माइनस थर्टी फोर दैट इज इलेवन डिग्री सेल्सियस सो इलेवन डिग्री सेल्सियस इज योर रेंज सो दिस इज द रेंज गाइज नेक्स्ट इज योर अप्रोच आई होप यू वुड बी अंडरस्टैंडिंग द टर्म्स दैट आर दैट वी आर यूजिंग इन टूडेज वीडियो नेक्स्ट इज योर अप्रोच सो गाइज द अप्रोच is one of the basic thing that we use while designing a cooling tower without knowing the approach we cannot attain the good cooling with we, uh, we cannot attain a effective cooling tower we will not be sure that whether our cooling tower will be able to provide cold water or not so but approach is approach is your difference between cold water temperature and wet bulb temperature so basically uh, from designer's point of view there is a thumb rule uh your uh, your cold water temperature should be at least 3 degree celsius plus your wet bulb temperature so that means your cooling tower can't provide uh, cooling water equal to your wet bulb temperature so its temperature should always be higher than it so for example if our wet bulb temperature is 28 degree celsius if our wet bulb temperature is 28 degree celsius so our cooling tower will only be able to provide a temperature of cold water that is around 31 32 degree celsius so it won't be able to provide a cold water temperature below 32 degree celsius because uh, as per the wet bulb temperature concept we won't be we won't be having air uh, that can take temperature below 32 degree celsius so this is the fund of approach so next is your cooling tower effectiveness cooling tower effectiveness is the ratio of range to the ideal range that is the difference of cooling water inlet and ambient wet bulb temperature or if we simplify it it is your range by range plus approach so if you want to know that uh, the, what is the effectiveness of cooling tower how much how effectively our cooling tower is being working so we calculate it by range upon range plus approach so guys this is a, a important terminology that designers use to calculate the effectiveness of cooling tower so i hope there might be some uh, clarity in range approach and cooling tower effectiveness generally people get confused about three things so let's see and see last slide uh, what are the losses in cooling towers so this is one of the most important aspect in your cooling tower as i told you in our first slide today that we make a water has to be added in cooling tower so why we why we need to add this make a water because there are some losses in cooling tower first is your evaporation loss second is your drift loss third is your blow down loss so in order to see so in order to um, uh, maintain the water in in the system because of these losses we have to add some water separately in our system so guys what is your evaporation loss so when hot water comes in contact with dry air some water gets evaporated and goes out with the outgoing air if you see cooling tower you would be seeing that uh, above the fan some water is going away with the hot air so because of this evaporation loss our system gets water deficient so how this evaporation loss is calculated this is a general formula 0.0085 into 1.8 into circulation rate into t1 minus t2 basically uh, the latent heat of vaporization is has been has been uh, equal to mc delta t so uh, from there we have calculated this evaporation loss next is your drift loss drift loss is basically a very minor loss as i already told you to eliminate drift loss we use drift eliminators it is the water that goes out of tower through wind so we have to stop this water also and uh, when this water goes out of the tower so this will also create a water deficiency so water drift loss is basically given by 0.02% of your circulating water so 0.02% of circulating water is your drift loss next and most important is your blow down loss so blow down loss is guys what happens is when a water from our system gets evaporated continuously so there are some remains and the total dissolved solids remains in our water increases and the and the point and the cap and the uh, ratio of this tds increases due to which there are problem problems uh, there may be problems in our process and our tubes may get choked because of this high tds so we have to maintain this tds so how blow down loss is calculated blow down loss is given by evaporation loss by coc minus 1 so what this coc is coc is your cycles of concentration generally cooling tower suppliers uh, they offer us cycles of concentration around 5 to 7 
so if you are having a cooling tower cycles of circulation 5 to 7 so that means your cooling tower will be requiring a blow down after a uh, five cycles uh, or after seven cycles so this is your cycles of concentration and cycles of some concentration how it is calculated it is given by the ratio of dissolved solids in circulating water to the dissolved solids in maker water so generally it's a whole number as uh, the total dissolved solids in circulating water will be higher uh, as compared to the uh, so dissolved solids in your maker water so these are the three losses and the most important losses that occurs in a cooling tower evaporation loss drift loss and blow down loss and guys to calculate the maker water requirement for a cooling tower we add evaporation loss with drift loss and blow down loss when th these three losses are calculated the quantity the maker water quantity is uh, given maker water can uh, quantity can be calculated so guys i hope in today's video you would be able to get the all the basic terms that are related with cooling towers and that are used while studying a cooling tower or making it so guys for more videos and updates please like follow and subscribe to our channel so guys thank you for watching the video thanks a lot